you all for participating in that um, conversation. I hope you all got as much out of it as I did. I'm going to introduce our next guests, which they're going to be talking about the new blockchain models for capital and infrastructure investment. We've actually got Deborah Simpi. Is it Simpie? Or, or just in Pierre, you mean? Yeah, okay. I was like, oh, is this is fancy. This is French. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, we're awesome. kind of on a, yeah, what kind of day it is, right? Uh, right. I got you. He was the CEO of, it's Althea, right? Correct. Like yep. the, okay, there's a famous tennis player named Althea, and I love that name personally. And also Nick Nafak, president of IOHK. And some of you might remember Deborah from one of our last events, which was Proximity. She was very popular, very beloved. And so we just had to have her back today. So Deborah Actually, and- so, Sorry to interrupt you, Grace. I'm, I, I'm in charge of commercial innovation at IOHK. I'm definitely not the president, just to be clear. Oh, okay. Well, you got a promotion right here, live <laughs> on Uncensored. Good I, thing I, that this- I'm sure some of our fellow staff will get a check mark on that, but yeah, no. Uh, Okay, that, that's what was in my notes. But listen, if that helps with you getting some sort of promotion, I mean, let's put that out there into the universe. So I'll let you all kick it off with this conversation about, you know, how blockchain is opening up new ways for us to share. It's encouraging transparency. It's hopefully, you know, allowing us to have a more balanced level of risk, especially when creating new financial vehicles for building and investing in hard assets of digital infrastructure. So I'll let you all take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, Thank you, everyone, for having me here today. I'm so excited to share, um, uh, especially I think since both Nick and I's projects um, really intersect with like daily life and real world things. um, It's really easy to see the tangible benefits of what um, a distributed ledger and blockchain can provide. I'm going to share my screen and kind of kick it off with a few um, slides about um, what Althea does and a um, little bit about how that works. And then um, you know, Nick, please feel free to kind of jump in where this side of intersects with your work as well. And um, for those in the audience, please feel free to you know um, uh, join with some questions here. Sorry about that. Let me present this. Uh, and we can hopefully get to those at the end as well. Um, So Althea uh, is a platform and protocol for what we call multi-stakeholder or decentralized internet networks. So instead of um, kind of one company owning um, all of the infrastructure and service layer, like how ISPs are formatted now, like you think of Comcast or CenturyLink, the Althea platform and protocol allows for there to be many different owners um, of both the infrastructure and decouples the service layer. So local groups and companies can provide that service um, separate from investment in the infrastructure. And um, uh, <laughs> when I was, as I was saying earlier, like this intersects a lot with all of our daily life, um, you know, access to the internet and access to online uh, really affects us all in different ways every day and affects, of course, our whole, you know, kind of society as well. Um, and one of the things I think is really interesting is sometimes when we think about um, lack of broadband access, we think about emerging markets, um, but really the U.S. is also um, struggles with this as well. We see um, that the internet is very siloed to one carrier and because it is so siloed, it's not actually that we have lack of um, broadband capacity. It's just that it's very, you know, sort of closed off from our ability to have an open marketplace. Um, and what's interesting to me also, and I think this also, um, Nick, you can probably speak to this a bit later as well, is is that um, even in urban areas where there is infrastructure, uh, just the, uh, for example, like in Portland, Oregon, 13% of uh, the people that live in urban areas that have access to more than one carrier um, actually do not have any broadband. Um, and I think the number is closer to about 18% in New York City. Right? So there are actually many kind of different nuanced issues about our digital lives that sort of prevent us from being able to access um, access broadband um, and other services as well. Um, yeah, I don't think it's not just a question of, of access, right? It's also a question of having uh, you know some form of identity to qualify for yes. certain services, right? That allows the mobile network operator uh, to, to onboard you for, you know, in a postpaid service, but obviously in a prepaid service, that's not the case, right? So, so those numbers are a bit more pertinent for the prepaid 
you know, base. But either, any way you cut it, there's still a significant amount of the, the population that is, you know, unbanked, uh, about 6% or about 14 million Americans, at least according to the, uh, recent FDIC research. Yeah, and I think when we talk about the underbanked, that number just grows exponentially more. There's something like 73 million people in the U.S. that have prepaid phones. And I think that's really indicative of the actual number that really don't have good access to financial services. Because if you do have good access to financial services, you usually get a phone on a plan, right? So these are kind of the folks that, for whatever reason, um, struggle to um, you know get access because of digital identity or un being underbanked. What was really surprising to me as we started to build out these networks in the U.S. was how many people actually like banked at their local grocery store, or gas station, or like corner store, and how you know how um, prevalent that that was. And I, I really think we're not really getting a good measure of that. So I think those numbers that you quoted, Nick, are like very pertinent and also probably a little bit too <laughs> pretty too conservative, right? Yeah, again, it depends on like your definition, right? But but yeah, there's there's certainly a larger capture um, if you consider like the, the underbanked, but versus yeah. just strictly yeah. unbanked. But yeah, any way you cut it, there's there's a, a largely underserved population that needs financial services. Yeah, so I mean, the, these are all these kind of barriers to access that we looked at. So it's not just lack of infrastructure; it's also like inflexible infrastructure. Like, like I said, um, within our communities themselves, we both have you know the the vertical assets uh, to project uh, antenna signals and radios, um, and we also have uh, you know carriers with excess bandwidth. Um, for the most part in many areas anyway. So when we look at what Althea enables us to do, different property owners can host these. Uh, uh, whether it's radios or provide extra bandwidth, and they get paid sort of programmatically and auto automatically. And as I said earlier, that local installation um, and network, what we call a network operator, sort of decoupled. So it allows for flexible infrastructure investments that are transparently settled onto the blockchain um, and then decoupled from that service layer, which creates a lower build out cost, um, you know, more net, uh, more efficient network configuration. So instead of like in a lot of the areas that we have built out in, there is, um, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily make sense to put one central tower. There's a lot of areas with hills or trees that that's actually not an ideal network configuration. Um, so this is the kind of, you know, what what in many like rural communities this looks like. We have these different colors are represented by, um, you know, uh, participants in the network who are hosting extra hardware and then get, getting paid automatically actually just through the, the blockchain wallet in their home router. Um, and with Althea, it's um, every, all traffic is encrypted, and we use stable coins for processing payments. So there's none of that, um, you know, speculative aspect of it. Um, it's simply a revenue share between um, uh, between the different stakeholders in the network. Another really exciting thing about what we do, um, which uh, I um, uh, I'm always like really excited about to talk about, um, is that we have a price aware routing protocol. So not only is the market open and um, you know sort of paying revenue throughout um, throughout the, the the topology, it's also routing based on the user's choice if if they prefer a um, more cost effective or a higher quality connection. So you really do have you know open market dynamics that happen here. Um, and you know, this is kind of what like a breakdown for this multi-stakeholder network can look like. And what's exciting about this when, you know, kind of this talk is about different ways to invest in the infrastructure. Because we've decoupled that service layer, someone can invest in just, you know, the middle mile fiber. Um, for example, we have a network in, in Illinois where um, there's an investment just into, you know, 12 miles of fiber that, um, uh, owner of that infrastructure gets paid a few cents a gigabyte, makes basically $15 per subscriber, um, and then doesn't assume the demand risk of the rest of the network build out, um, which is sort of allows um, for kind of flexible configurations for networks. And also that transparency piece. I mean, I think Nick, you can really speak to this a bit, but um, you know, one of the things when we talk about emerging markets or places where the legal system isn't um, as robust as the U.S., having that transparent settlement is so important. Yeah, it's, it's especially a bigger problem uh, in a lot of telecom networks where they have uh, issues with fraud or you know uh, billing disputes and things along those lines. Where it's if there isn't some degree of transparency, then it's really difficult to know you know, whether or not the allegations are true. And more importantly, it just facilitates commerce if 
everybody is referring to single source of truth publicly in terms of which transactions actually took place. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is going to be a real big game changer for infrastructure, large infrastructure investments in emerging markets as well. Um, and, and one of the other kind of interesting things we can do is we can make it more, you know, because we're using a smart contract essentially to um, configure what that investment in revenue share looks like, we can do some dynamic things. Like one of the things that I think might be interesting to do is things like, you know, um, charging for bandwidth based on time or on capacity. And so we can really get into um, interesting dynamics as, uh, you know, the kind of the market expands here. Um, and so, you know, this is what's really interesting about um, our kind of network topology too. It also creates a really resilient network, which you know I think over the last few years we've noticed <laughs> the internet infrastructure sort of creaking as it's it's uh, as capacity um, or our use is kind of growing. And um, one of the great things about how the way Althea works is that it's that it's all inter interconnected and open access. So if one of these um, main links to fiber goes down, then the whole rest of the network just sort of easily. Uh, fails over. Um, uh, the other thing that I want to sort of bring up here too is that it's technology agnostic. So um, the technology works in um, whether it's uh, fixed wireless, fiber, or LTE. LTE is especially interesting because then we can configure these networks to provide IoT mobility access as well. Um, and then we can get into that price aware routing protocol, also um, working across slicing as well, which means we can set priorities on towers based on user preference instead of the carrier preference. And then it gets really interesting. And then maybe we don't need carrier roaming agreements anymore. Um, okay, so you can see an example of kind of what that looks like communicated to the user um, uh, and that redundancy we just talked about there. Um, and this is a little bit more, I'm gonna skip through a little bit of this pretty quickly here so we have time to have some dialogue and discussion as well. Um, you know, this is also another thing that's made it very easy for us in emerging markets to actually essentially, um, or in the US as well, provide what, <laughs> what we call edge labor, which is essentially um, having more of like a centralized knock and then folks kind of at the edges can um, build these networks very, um, you know, easily and simply not and, and not have to have the burden of all the technical knowledge. And we can do some cool things uh, because it's blockchain as well with how we do flexible payments and credits. Um, uh, it's so wealthy is like a prepaid system. You load up your router very easily with a widget on the dashboard there with the debit card. A text message is going to inform the user low balance, and then you um, and then you basically just load up your um, your router. With what's also that's also allowed us to set a free tier. Um, so all of the um, so so everyone who participate in Althea Network can have kind of an always on, you know, minimal service level. Um, and, that, and you know, when we talk about like municipal networks and things like that, that can be configured to be much higher and closer to like, you know, broadband speeds too. Um, so one of the things with that is that, uh, so essentially right now we onboard through the Ethereum uh, blockchain into, uh, into XDAI. So as we moved over to uh, another blockchain called Cosmos, um, we started to build what we call the Gravity Bridge. And what's really exciting about the Gravity Bridge um, is that it batches transactions. So you're sharing that transaction cost with maybe 100 other users. So your, your gas or transaction costs are much more uh, minimal and predictable um, than you would have with just settling directly on a layer one like Ethereum. That also allows us to do in the future very exciting things with that money that's potentially on the, um, you know, that router wallet or phone wallet, um, where you know users can then perhaps participate in a decentralized finance, maybe earning interest or taking out a loan. And I think Nick, that you have some some products along that line as well, too, right? Or or, or, oh, yeah. or yeah, we got we got a little product called Cardano that's got an eighty billion dollar market cap. So hopefully you guys will be considering uh, Cardano instead of Cosmos because uh, we just released smart contract functionality on time um, uh, very recently, it's last Sunday. So uh, definitely worth considering uh, for what you're doing. And in addition to um, other up and coming assets that would be very useful in this context. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's an interesting context happening right now with this interoperability between blockchains happening, right? Whether there's, uh, you know, as as we sort of expand behind, you know, beyond uh, what was just Bitcoin and Ethereum, right, to the this new sort of idea of a, a multi-chain future, perhaps, right, where there's the same kind of interoperability that we're trying to build in the telco space could perhaps exist. Um, Absolutely, and, and that's really very much the spirit at IOHKs is to look yeah. for, you know, the, the right technology for the right use case, right? In some cases, yes. it makes sense to use um, Cardano and, and ADA, its underlying asset for things like digital identity uh, and, and, you know, things in DeFi. Um, in other cases, you know, there's there's more side chains and other types of technology that may be more pertinent, you know, depending on what your needs are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just real quick, we do have, uh, you know, so network operators have a suite of kind of met network management tools that pulls information from the blockchain about their, you know, their revenue transparently as well, too. Um, and this sort of allows it to do it in kind of a vendor and technology agnostic way. Um, it's kind of another example of how cities can participate in kind of a holistic type of um, a network. Uh, because it's multi-stakeholder, you can have both fiber networks um, interacting with LTE for IoT, um, for mobility, you can have fixed wireless extending to some of the neighborhoods as well. Um, so we really get to do some interesting and dynamic, you know, things when we start to, un, you know, uh, break up these silos and, um, and uh, kind of make it interoperable and open. Um, but yeah, and I'll turn that over uh, here to, to you, Nick. So you ha I think we have a few minutes left. Are you there? Yep. So let's go ahead and get started here. So again, I, I am a director of commercial innovation over at IOHK. And IOHK, which is soon to be rebranded as IO Global, is a technology and technology product and services company that develops uh, new kinds of uh, blockchain and digital ledger tech, in addition to new asset classes to support things like financial inclusion um, in emerging markets. Um, so let's take a look at what that means exactly. If we take a step back and we look at like the, the total wealth distribution by country in 2019, you can see, not surprisingly, that the vast majority of the wealth is distributed between you know, the US, China, Japan, and so on. And more interestingly, when you look at sort of the, the, the growing uh, debt to GDP ratio in a lot of those top countries, uh, you can see that there's you know, obviously a huge amount of debt uh, versus GDP that's, that's coming in. And you know, why that's important, essentially, it really, there's a lot of people in the world that, that aren't necessarily Included in a lot of the fiat currencies that are existing right now uh, have you know varying degrees of sustainability. If you look at their inflationary models, um, for for instance, this year alone uh, we're looking at you know almost north of a five percent inflationary rate in the U.S. I mean, if that continues, it's going to lead to a tremendous amount of inflation or even a ten-year period, um, and that's going to impact many people in the population. They're going to be considering you know not only other assets but also other ways to to redistribute wealth on the planet. So, you know, how many people are, you know, included or excluded in this particular case from financial services? Now, we just made the distinction between uh, an unbanked and underbanked population. And for those that don't know, those that are unbanked have no access to any kind of financial services uh, whatsoever. And that's what I'm talking about here. Underbanked populations often do have access to bank accounts, but, you know, they can't uh, obtain fair lending rates or uh, good terms for insurance and, and so on. And so this specifically addressing of an economic identity in emerging markets, primarily in, in about 45% in uh, Southeast Asia and roughly about 34% in Africa being the lion's share. And the reason why is, is most people don't have uh, the documentation or the assets or the services that they can access to you know, accommodate uh, sort of the banked financial services that they would obtain in, in sort of a, a more developed market. So it's not for lack of, of, of wanting it, it's uh, for lack of, you know, often many countries, for instance, in Ethiopia, 34% of the population doesn't even have a birth certificate. And so kind of at IOHK, kind of our focus is to be um, one of those com leading companies in the world that delivers uh, a method to create what we call an economic identity so that people can begin to really just build a profile 
and so that you know they can they can provide documents in a self-sovereign fashion, meaning that they own, run, and manage their own identity. And this is not rhetoric. This is actually happening today in Ethiopia specifically. We just had an increase from five million to roughly uh, twice that size, the number of students uh, who are now going to use a digital ID program instead of a paper-based program for establishing their identity and uploading other forms of documentation to create a, a proof positive profile that can tie in with you know, their, uh, their grades and, and other types of government issued documents and get stamped off by the government. But the key is that they own, run, and manage their own identity, which is very seminal. It's one of the few programs in the world today that's, that's actually being endorsed uh, and run very soon by, by the government. Kind of the next steps are to deliver some form of analytics on a lot of these open uh, sort of identification services. So, you know, many of the countries involved can, can understand how to scale them up into payments, lending and credit insurance, and ultimately some form of open banking that is somewhat distributed amongst the population. And the key point here being that there's a lot of interesting things that we're doing in the crypto space and DeFi. In fact, IOHK, like I just said, is uh, one of the primary uh, technology um, providers and developers of infrastructure like Cardano and the asset ADA, which is the third largest uh, cryptocurrency to date with over $80 billion market cap, which we you know, raised in value from three cents to $3 in the course of two years, because many people uh, see this promise of going from sort of decentralized finance or DeFi into what we call open finance, which is a little different from the mainstream financial services definition of the term. Like most banks and institutions consider open finance to be, you know, uh, uh, agreements that they make between themselves, how they manage and share a lot of data uh, for the sake of protecting, you know, consumer privacy for, to a certain extent uh, and other forms of, of data sharing in terms of lending and otherwise for their business. However, what we're talking about is a system that allows finance to become not only better, faster, cheaper by moving things more quickly and efficiently, but also more open, fair, and transparent. So that, you know, in a lot of Africa, for instance, many people don't necessarily trust some of the centralized documents and can't get access to them for bureaucratic overhead reasons and also just because they simply were in villages and other pragmatic reasons. And instead, now they can assemble an amount of other documents that they manage themselves and won't be subject to any form of fraud or corruption, uh, you know, in terms of being issued and established. So that's kind of really what we're talking about from our side. And we're quite excited to see the nexus between businesses like yours, uh, who yes. hopefully will come over to Cardano and other uh, types of you know, blockchains and assets that we're, we're building because the elephant in the room for a lot of this is a lot of people are developing variable assets, but you know, for payments, for instance, or lending, variable assets just don't work in a, in a, in a, in a environment. It's very difficult to have it because they often, like Bitcoin, for instance, will vary often by 20 to 40%, depending on you know what's right. going on in, in the market. So that's where we are like pioneering things like stable coins and really are the most referenced R&D blockchain company in the world right now for you know taking things from science and converting them into math and eventually technology to be the front runners to you know facilitate these types of services. Yeah, and one of the things you know we we do also yeah agree that like you know the infrastructure payments should be made in stable coins. We've always worked um, usually in Dai um, for all of the the payments that are traversing the Althea network. Um, but yeah, I, th I think you know you highlighted n not only kind of from the personal perspective of not having a digital. Uh, um, identity, but I think from those that want to invest or, or put their money to work in emerging markets, um, there has been so much risk uh, because you don't have a population that, you know, um, has digital identities. There's really kind of no metrics to, to measure that. Um, you know, so I think I think that it kind of it kind of works on both sides. We haven't seen as much infrastructure investment into emerging markets that we could see simply because they can't enforce legal uh, uh, legal contracts um, and and you can't you, you have a population that you're serving that doesn't have a digital identity doesn't have digital money right and all of these things that create friction to be able to set up commerce and open markets right well I don't know if that's really true I mean uh, it depends on how you look at it, really, because Africa has like a 14% ROE in terms of return on, you know, an equity for a lot of uh, banking investments. And that's the second most profitable market in the world. 
you know, uh, you're right in the sense that maybe it doesn't have the same level of volume in terms of investments as maybe like China or the U.S., but, but you know, it has the second fastest growing GDP right now and one of the most saturated like mobile mar money markets in the world and one of the youngest so, markets in the world. Right. So like, but when we're talking about, let's say, electrical grid, we're talking about energy infrastructure, we're talking about roads, you're talking about transportation, you're talking about broadband infrastructure, towers, these kinds of things, fiber. Do you, you know, it, it, it does seem like there there's a little bit of, you know, catch up to do there. Right. And, um, you know, we've seen folks, that's especially like, uh, you know, connectivity capital has done a really great job there. But a lot of larger, more centralized companies have struggled, um, you know, putting in infrastructure in emerging markets. So I wondered if maybe you could speak to that a bit too. I don't, I'm curious to your perspective there. Yeah, I, I have a unique perspective because I've been one of the global companies to actually connect a lot of the mobile network operators. Like uh, many years ago, I, I helped connect over 2000 mobile network operators worldwide for uh, text messaging. And we literally connected Africa to Europe, to Asia uh, firsthand. And so uh, successfully. And I think what the problem is with a lot of other companies is that doing business in the African locale requires a pretty intensive on-site presence. And it's actually not true. In some areas, uh, Africa is very well served. Um, you look at South yep. Africa, you look it's at- a big continent. <laughs> it's a big South continent, Africa. right? Yeah, so it's I think continent. it's a big, we need to talk about more about like emerging markets, right? As opposed to just Africa yeah. as a continent. It's obviously it's very nuanced and there's there's a lot of different, yeah, um, this was, you know, this was diversity. It's, it's a big mix, right? And, and, yes, and by absolutely. large, like, you know, the data consumption, for instance, in North Africa and South Africa is, is very significant. If you look at the GSMA statistics on, you know, the number of subscribers, it's pretty astounding. Um, even in Ethiopia alone, for instance, they have 20 million subscribers. And the, the, the problem is, the challenge is, is that there's a large concentration and um, sort of provisioning of services in, in high, highly dense population areas. But they have a pretty significant last mile problem because yes. there's a lot of adjunct rural areas where, you know, the U S as well has a similar, <laughs> right? Because again, I mean, this is why we, we set up, I and mean, this is why our, our, our model is I think so important, right? Because this, this problem is just a, it's a business economics numbers. You can't necessarily, you know, if you have a, a more sparse population, you really do need to leverage the existing assets that exist rather than building, um, you know, new infrastructure where it doesn't necessarily need to be built. So, um, yeah, I think, I, I, I think this is just a you know an economics problem that we you know can solve with decentralized infrastructure that's what's so exciting about it well yeah that and also like you know there have to be clear incentives for people in the population to own run and manage um, these last mile solutions we work uh, with another yeah. partner called WMC global and wmc is doing great work in africa for instance but you really to be successful in these deployments it's always the same story you have to be on site you have to have an in-country presence and you know, being present in Addis Ababa doesn't mean that you know in Kenya or uh, Nigeria or you know another province in Africa that you're going to have success like you have to be there on site and the populations are very different you know M Pesa rolled out on my network and you know uh, we were one of the first people to do that and essentially um, you know, they just had a prime population for it at the time. And the reason why that model has had trouble proliferating is because it's just, Africa is so diverse. Um, my mother was actually born in Africa, in, uh, in Morocco. And, uh, and the, you know, the needs of the Moroccans is so different than, you know, the needs of Nigerians versus the needs of the Kenyans. And, you know, but it's one Africa. So in short, there's a significant opportunity there. It just comes down to, you know, really logistical things like making sure that equipment is properly distributed. There's a quality of service. There's somebody managing it. There's a certification program for, you know, making sure that, you know, the assets that are uh, supporting this infrastructure, which is what we do at IOHK and the dApps that support, you know, those assets are actually going to, re to deliver a certain quality of service in terms of performance and security, because that's another problem that people don't talk about is deploying and running edge nodes is, is, is not trivial for most people that aren't in the space. I think you're muted. Oh, <laughs> it sounded really exciting. So I wanted to hear what you had to say. <laughs> I, I still, I, I'm still not unfortunately hearing you. So 
while we're waiting for him to come back to, I want to just to wrap up what you said too, Nick. Like um, we uh, we have uh, been building uh, for several years Althea Networks out and have, um, you know, I, I think it's very poignant that it's important that the infrastructure works well, which is why we have emergency services, fire stations, um, you know, uh, uh, business owners and farms and things that rely on our internet every day. So we definitely understand very viscerally that um, those key points. Yeah, and also like one last point, I mean, in terms of like data center infrastructure, right, because this is part of why we're here, there is a huge and growing need to make sure that there's a certain quality of service, you know, and support uh, in country for some of the services. And there's a misperception that there isn't revenue there. You know, 20 million subscriber base like in Ethiopia is, is a decent sized mobile network operator and they do a decent amount of revenue. And, you know, so there is a significant opportunity in a lot of these emerging markets, especially Southeast Asia, colossal opportunity in terms of, you know, last mile support um, and a big misperception that there is revenue there. This isn't charity. I mean, there's there's definitely, you know, a significant um, opportunity in terms of like creating better technology for people that need it. Awesome. Well, Back. oh, there, see, Back. as soon as I start talking, your audio <laughs> works. It's like, I'm like a fairy godmother. Like I spill a little <laughs> like fairy dust and it worked. <laughs> Requires a proper cycle, the proper, um... The proper sacrifices may not have been made to the demo gods, but I can talk way too long and we're right on top of blockchain infrastructure procurement. And so for uh, Nick and Deborah, we don't have further time for questions, but thank you so much for joining us and we'll look forward to catching more of you in the future because I did enjoy that. Thanks so much for having me.